Welcome to Free Garden Course, your guide to an earth-friendly landscape that tastes great and looks beautiful too. Helping you build your very own organic oasis for Mike's Green Garden and the Green Organic Gardener podcast. What is an organic oasis, you ask? I believe an organic oasis is not just a space where food is grown, but so much more. I think it's a place where you will want to spend most of your time when the weather is nice. A place to relax and enjoy and visit with family and friends. If you grow some of your own produce there, all the better. But most of all, it's good for the environment. And there's a checklist you can get that we've built um, where I list the parts every organic oasis should have. So most of all, I think it should have a place to sit and enjoy. Chairs, a bench, a table. We're not just building some deep vegetable beds. We're building a place you're going to want to hang out. A pollinator border full of herbs and companion plants. A water feature for birds and butterflies. A shade tree or some kind of umbrella, you know, like a beach umbrella. Um, we have an essential tools list that you can also download that are easily accessible, but make sure they're protected. Um, a soil building system, some kind of compost, either worms, cover crops, manure. We're going to talk about those today. Um, an earth friendly lawn full of native fescues and clover and a fescue is a kind of type of native grass that probably grows in your area and you want to find um, a native grass or fescue that's good for your area and then clover is a great soil builder and some of the first flowers for the bees and just should be part of every earth friendly lawn. Um, I think every landscape should have some welcoming pathways. Like I just always love the little like human touches in a garden, like either a little bench or like a little walkway or a pathway or a door or a secret little, just, I don't know. I just love little fences or any of those kind of cool things. So some welcoming pathways, some seasonal fruit. One thing I have definitely learned since I started my podcast, um, is how great fruit is and fruit are almost always the kind of things that you plant once and it just keeps giving back. It's not like an annual vegetable that has to be planted every year. Um, some optional raised vegetable beds. If you do want to grow vegetables, that's kind of a whole, um, uh, part of gardening on its own and then fencing protection because gardening is a lot of hard work. So we don't want you to, um, lose your hard work. So just a quick thing about us. If you don't listen to my podcast, Mike's actually the head gardener and I'm Jackie Marie Beyer, the host of the Green Organic Gardener podcast for five years now. It'll be five years, January 29, 2020. I've been interviewing backyard gardeners, market farmers, nutritionists, and sustainable ag experts from around the world learning the best techniques to grow the most nutritious food in the easiest manner. And now we've brought these secrets to you. So Mike's the gardener. He had a back to business for many years. He just retired last year full time. I'm your teacher. I'm a classroom teacher. That's the, in the middle of the picture, me launching my podcast and then the host of the organic gardener podcast. So, um, just a little bit about the organic method. One of the big things I feel like Mandy Gerth on my show summed it up the most that it's not as much about what you don't do as what you do do. And the organic method basically consists of building a healthy ecosystem where plants thrive and disease is kept at a minimum. Plants are healthy and able to resist most problems. You have beneficial insects to keep pests at bay and a variety of plants all living together. It's not a monoculture. And as you can see, it's just gorgeous. So, and there's like um, a giant bed that we grow peppers in, cucumbers, I think, and marigolds are in there in that picture. Um, just my husband, Mike grows some great things. So at the end of this short free garden class, you'll know three ways to improve your soil naturally, what you put on your organic lawn, a question I constantly get, uh, the most productive crops to grow in Northwest Montana and how, oh, I'm having problems with my mic. Sorry. Um, how, you know, what's most productive where you live. Deep beds versus garden beds, what's right for you, and essential tools that you'll need. So we have a checklist of those. Um, I think it's important to talk about what is a garden bed. In this picture, you can see both um, perennials and annuals. There's corn, there's lettuce growing, there's tomatoes, there's um, dill and oregano and basil and 
lots of flowers to learn the beneficial insects. So perennials, annuals, and um, all together. Mostly annuals, I guess, in this picture. Um, the bed that's in the middle where the peace sign is are perennials. Everything else are annuals, I think. Anyway, um, on the left, we have a picture of a garden bed, which basically has a rock border around it. Um, it's got that board on the back, but mostly those plants are planted directly in the ground with like a layer of compost mixed in. Whereas the picture on the right is like a deep bed that you can see, like it's full those boards, it's got like a foot of healthy, good soil above ground. You can see where the pebbles are on the ground, the grass, the lawns on the ground, and that's like way up above the ground, full of tomato plants there, and pepper plants maybe. And so I think it's important to define the difference exactly what's a garden bed and what's a deep raised bed. Um, so I basically went through that. Why deep vegetable beds? On my show, I talk about this a lot, but if you don't listen to my podcast, you might not know already. The three reasons deep beds rock are, one, you can weed and harvest while sitting down. This is so much more enjoyable than bending over upside down, harvesting green beans or a basket of lettuce. Weeding becomes a relaxing pastime. It's just, instead of being a dreaded chore, like, I can just sit there for hours. Now, if you let your weeding get away from you, um, it's not as nice of garden therapy. But when you're just sitting on the edge of that bed, it's just lovely. Um, number two, you can fill the bed with the best quality soil you can afford or get your hands on, guaranteeing a fantastic start to growing healthy, nutrient-dense plants and produce. And number three, plants have lots of room to develop long roots, so you can plant using the biointensive method, which produces greater yields in a smaller space. And so Mike, in that picture of that boat there, he's got peas growing up, what's like, we call it the sail, and then there's lots of giant squashes, there's lettuce, there's zinnias, there's marigolds, um, there's the green bean teepee in the back. So to recap, why deep vegetable beds? Convenience, number two, great soil, and number three, greater yields. Before you plant a seed, you must know healthy food starts with healthy soil. Three ways we create healthy soil here. We build compost, we get local manure, either from our chickens that we have, or we've gotten like goat manure, sheep manure, donkey manure, horses, like people will put it in the paper. Not so much horses or like in a Facebook group. But a big bonus to healthy soil is that healthy soil reduces pests. Uh, did I talk about what green manure is? So growing a cover crop, growing your own compost or soil. Um, healthy soil starts with compost. So I talk about this compost bin that Mike built me for my 14th anniversary a lot, but I just love it because it's got these awesome slats that you can, the air flows through, you can take them out. And if you want to take the compost out, but it, then it will hold like a foot of compost in there. It's just the best bin. And most of all, it's right outside my kitchen window. Um, the first step is to start saving your food scraps and creating your own healthy soil. And I think this will play a video. Okay, so here's my radishes and my Swiss chard and greens, and they're just going right in the compost pile. And you can see that there's brown dry grass clippings for mowing the lawn, and then fresher green grass, lipping, grass clippings from mowing the lawn and then we just throw the vegetables on there and then you can turn it that day or you can turn it later like obviously it hasn't been turned in a while and compost is just so forgiving so I love composting if you don't already have a compost container for your kitchen if you're not already saving coffee grounds eggshells and produce waste I think you should start immediately um Vermiculture is another solution. Worm composting, that is way easier than you'd think. Like, after I talked to Denny Cray 
and he was telling me about it. I had a compost bin in my classroom and that's that bin on the left. And it was able to fill that whole tub on the right. And the tub on the right makes a great deep bed. Like we've planted um, basil in it or peppers in it or marigolds in it or just different. Every year, Mike's put something different in it. But that one plastic bin filled that whole tub. And I got great compost. The worms grew really big. And we put the... Um, bedding from the guinea pig in my classroom in there and it didn't smell it just sat in my classroom all year it was super easy um so something to think about if you live somewhere you want it to be in your garage or even it on your porch or in your apartment um like i said i had it in the classroom compost is what i call a clean job so my listeners know i'm not that big on gardening i don't always like to get my toes dirty or my teaching jeans dirty etc so but i do like composting and i really encourage you to do it we have like seven compost bins at our house um and we've got a compost components checklist for you plus a bonus three ingredient cheat sheet which is basically bananas, coffee grounds, and eggshells. And then I just wanted to make a plea because most people don't know food waste that goes into landfill does not decompose the same way as when it goes in the compost pile. In the landfill, it's compacted in a closed environment and releases methane gas into the atmosphere. In a compost pile, it decomposes in an aerobic environment decreasing the release of harmful greenhouse gases. So even if you're not a gardener, it's important to keep your food waste out of the landfill. Can you recycle your neighbor's scraps? Or can your neighbor recycle your scraps? So these lovely pictures are my friend Kara Bellamy's sustainability project. And she painted those lovely bee houses. And she collects the compost scraps from the people in her neighborhood. And this is just like her nonprofit organization. She's a realtor in real life. And she's in Florida. And I think the funny thing is, the other person who came on my show and talked about her compost community collecting system is on as far on the opposite side of the country in Washington state in Olympia, like west of Seattle, right in the ocean. Um, so I just encourage you to compost your scraps. It keeps your garbage from smelling anyway, and, um, find a compost pile to put them in, if not yours. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I am so happy to help you with your composting needs. You can write me at orgpodcast at gmail.com or go to the Organic Gardener Podcast website, organicgardenerpodcast.com. And you might listen to the interview I did with that crazy neighbor, Matthew Zoller, who's a high school English teacher and talks about how easy it is to raise chickens in the suburbs of the busy city where he lives. Um, you know, chickens do not require a rooster. They're still going to lay those eggs anyway. And from Alaska to Florida to other side of the world, my guests all find ways to garden naturally. And you can too. Um, one big thing that we did have a challenge with around here, I talked to Peggy Jane from, um, one of the local nurseries in episode four, make sure your manure is coming from cows that are not eating weed free hay or hay that has been sprayed with chemicals. So the weeds won't grow. Um, she talked about it and so did Jacqueline Freeman, who is a big, um, treatment free bee expert. So just a little heads up, make sure you know where you're getting your manure from. And then cover crops, the last part. But the funnest part, maybe, and I think you will like this if you haven't tried it, um, and you're a backyard gardener, I encourage you to grow a cover crop this year. Um, you'll get more into this once you have your planning design created and your garden started, but something to keep in your back of your mind right now. What a cover crop is, is basically just a cover crop you grow for the soil. And so John Jevons um, wrote a book called How to Grow More Vegetables, I think, than you ever thought possible um, in the smallest amount of space. She ke she worked at his um, like a little environmental center garden down in California, and she talked about they grew 60%, 60% of their growing area in crops that provide both food for them and food for the soil. 
and a great primer, which it's only like $5.95 or 6 bucks on Amazon. The Homegrown Humus Cover Crops in a No-Till Garden by Anna Hess. I think I've read that book like six times. And there's my Buckwheat Success. Buckwheat is really short crop, like it only takes 30 days. One of the secrets to organic gardening that people talk more and more about is never letting your soil be just dirt, like with nothing growing. Like if you harvest your cucumbers, get something in that ground within 24 hours is the goal. So buckwheat is a great in-between crop. If you pull out your carrots and it's not time to put in like a fall crop of lettuce, you can put buckwheat in and it will nourish your soil. Or if you haven't gardened before, it's a great to nourish your soil. And Anna Hess is in Virginia, so she's kind of a warmer weather cover crop um, person. But so easy, even I can do it. And that crop of buckwheat, it doesn't look it in that picture, but it was so gorgeous in bloom. Um, so the first thing you've got to think about is container basics. Where are you going to put those plants? Are you in an apartment in the middle of winter? So that giant basil plant on the left there or that by that curtain, I grew in the middle of a Montana winter on my windowsill. I've also got lettuce there, an arugula, a basil, a sage, a rosemary. Um, you know, do you want tomatoes? Are you ready to put a vegetable bed in your backyard? A lot of people talk to me about, Jackie, I don't have a mic, so how am I going to build my deep vegetable beds? Um, and we'll try to find you a solution for that. Did you just buy a house with a lawn full of dandelions? I had a friend last year who bought a house in the middle of winter and was surprised to see all the dandelions in the fall. We're going to talk about what to do for that. Does the high price of berries make you cringe? I know I, now that Mike's got a mini farm, so my husband built like a mini farm a few years ago, I can pretty much avoid the produce aisle from August till November. And it is so hard the rest of the year to eat food that's not fresh from the garden. Um, are you dreaming of the most delicious tomato you can grow? What are you going to put your seeds in? Are they going to go in pots? You know, the one thing about pots, they're super convenient. They have a lot of pluses, but they definitely dry out quickly on hot summer days. So they're going to need more watering. Um, but they do add a great splash of color when planted with bright annuals like those petunias. Um, and so maybe just put your pots near a convenient water source. Like in that picture, that's at the top of Mike's Bee Creek. So there's always going to be water there. Um, here's my friend Nola's rosemary. I mean, those plants are just gorgeous. So the nice thing is you can bring them inside in winter. Um, rosemary and basil definitely don't like the cold. Um, so here's a recycled option. Mike found this old boat that leaked. Um, and so he put all that soil in it and finally um, planted it one year. He dreamed about it for many years. And you can see those tomatoes are just huge in all that super healthy soil. Just remember, um, one, it's going to be super heavy, but also you want to get the best soil you can afford, and that's going to take a lot of it. But if you have access to good soil, um, there you go. There's a simple solution. Um, so back in 2007, I think these pictures are above might put in um, those deep beds and then he planted it with the bean teepee. Um, and so then the bean teepee like added lots of nitrogen to that soil. It's a great soil builder. And then we also put those other raspberry beds down on the bottom left. And one of the things I've learned since I started my podcast is a great thing to do instead of digging up all that sod is lay the cardboard down on top of the sod and when it doesn't get any light, it will kill the grass. And then you can just put really good dirt on top of that. So that's a good way to build a bed. Um, so here's last February 2019. I went to the store and bought like, you know, those herbs for eating in the produce section and put them in some dirt. I planted that little bed of arugula, the parsley, and the parsley made it through the summer and is still growing on my windowsill in 2020. Um, and there's just nothing like having fresh herbs in your food, especially in the middle of winter. Uh, these are microgreen sunflowers that my stepdaughter planted me last spring, and it was so great. I was just like, just leave that tray. And I just picked off of that tray for a month. It was so fantastic. 
Um, seeds come in two main categories. There's seeds that can go in the ground before a frost and seeds that go in after all danger of frost is over. So seeds that need to go in the ground before a frost, you're going to want to start indoors, like these tomatoes. Mike's got some zinnias there, peppers, things that um, take longer to grow. You know, maybe they're going to take three months to grow, but we only have like two months of growing season or whatever your growing season is. You need to know, you need to read your packets and figure out when am I going to harvest it and then count backwards and figure out, is it going to go in the ground before that? Or do I need to start it indoors ahead of time? Um, the main secret to a healthy, nutritious garden is creating a healthy ecosystem, including beneficial insects and pollinators. And, you know, some of those pollinators are bees and they require water sources that they can drink from without drowning. Now we have a big hill. You might not want to build something this big of a water feature, but Mike built this like sweet little bee creek and like, it gets like, it collects moss and the bees just love to sit on that moss and drink from the itty bitty teeny tiny puddles and they don't have to worry about drowning in like a big thing of water. So you want to have somewhere for the bees to drink. Um, my brand new vegetable gardener challenge. So if I was starting over without Mike or we had a smaller place, we had to move like the three things I would grow would be lettuce, carrots, peas, a cherry tomato plant. And then like, if you can do more than that, like a fruit tree or like some raspberry bushes or blueberry bushes or like strawberry plants, like some kind of fruit. But these are the things that I would plant. And then of course, like herbs and flowers, but my brand new vegetable gardener challenge, if I was going to garden. So the nice thing about lettuce is you can put lettuce in the ground. As soon as it can be worked, it will take a lot of frost and cold. And then if you're like done with gardening, like by June, you're like, wow, this was a bigger commitment than I thought, you know, then it's over with. Carrots take a little bit more time, but once you get a mulch, then they mostly just take watering. They are so sweet in the fall and you'll just be so happy if you have some fresh carrots growing. And then peas again are kind of like the lettuce and sugar snap peas today. Do you know they didn't even have sugar snap peas back in like the early eighties or something? Like it was a newly invented thing where you could eat the shell. <gasps> I love sugar snap peas. And those again, like you'll be picking them probably by like the 4th of July, just a fantastic first crop. Um, and then I say a cherry tomato plant because where we are in Montana, it's kind of hard. It can be, there's a lot of years where our tomatoes, you know, just are only green when we have to harvest them. And so a cherry tomato, you'll almost always get just fun cherries to pick and you can put it in a pot so you can move it around. It's just, I like a cherry plant. So I think that would be the most successful if you were going to start over lettuce, carrots, peas, a cherry tomato plant, and then any kind of fruit and then some herbs and flowers. So Big question. It took me forever to wrap my head around this. What's the difference between annuals and perennials and why do I care? And basically it's just like annuals have to be planted every year and can be put in a new spot like carrots or snapdragons or lettuce. Perennials come back by themselves every year and need to be planted somewhere more permanent. Like most of your herbs, fruit bushes, plants, rhubarbs, horseradish. So one, you're going to move and you're going to have to dig up the bed. Like that's the big difference. Like carrots, you have to dig it up. You don't want to dig up the perennial plant. So that's the big difference is redigging up your bed. Or even if you're doing no-till permaculture where you're not digging up the bed, um, I don't know. I, and there's probably people that would argue with me, but anyway, I highly recommend you plant as many perennials as you can get away with, which is funny because that picture is like almost all annuals. Just remember, whenever you plant perennials, they're basically there to stay, so they do better in permanent beds. Um, there's the perennials, the raspberries. So my next recommendation is plant as much fruit as you can. And those raspberry bushes just, it was so heavenly. We would get like a bowl full of raspberries every day for, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks during the summer, maybe a month. Just delicious. Um, and then the fruit trees, the apple trees, I wish we would have put them in sooner. I'm always amazed at how much fruit we get. Um... And so then that picture, there's like corn growing, there's tomato plants, there's lots of beautiful flowers, there's calendulas, marigolds, dill, there's lettuce, there's some herbs, there's those bluebells or whatever they are. Um, and then I always think it's important to think about what do you like to eat? So those chives or an herb, there's kind of my herb garden. There's a big tarragon plant, there's some sage, there's some thyme, um, and those chives are some of the first flowers to grow in the spring. So they're really nice because they really encourage the bees to come in. 
Um, companion planting, plant some beneficial flowers. So those are just a marigold with that beautiful butterfly on it. And Mike just gets the most massive marigolds to grow some years. It's just incredible how, like what monsters they become. And they are so good by tomatoes. One of the best ways to keep pests out of your garden is to grow plants they don't like. That tiny little marigold where the arrow is pointing next to the giant, um, is going to grow into a giant plant with this deep bed full of healthy soil and the tomato next to it will thrive as it protects it from lots of pests that just they don't like the way marigolds smell they don't like the way nasturtium smell there's just something about them um the other really important flowers to have in your garden is comfrey and borage other big uh beneficial pollinator drawing in flowers um, so there's Mike's mini farm. And as you can see, it's got lots of fence, deer fence around it to keep the bugs out. And then, so that is, see how it, there's no garden beds there. There's no, like nothing dividing or separating the beds from, um, the soil. So after you've got your, whatever you've decided you're going to plant planted, you've got to deal with some weeding. And so the best way Mike talks about is just getting them out when they're tiny, one of his favorite weeding tools is his cultivator hoe. He weeds the entire mini farm with that hoe, which is why he's so picky. Every weed comes out before he plants. Um, many, many of my guests have said that have large gardens say that the number one tool they can't live without is a sharp hole hoe. And then if you don't know what mulching is, mulching is so like, see how there's, it looks like there's hay, or I guess it's actually straw. Mike was like, don't put hay down. Hay will spread weeds. Tell people straw. So he gets straw, organic straw that we found from a local farm. And in between all your plants, after you've weeded them, if you put some water down, it will help, you know, retain moisture, reduces the need to water and reduces the need to weed. And then bonus, it's adding great decomposable material into your soil in the fall when you turn that all in. So the quicker you get to the weeds, the less likely you'll face an overwhelming number summer invasion. The more direct water you give your roots, you can make a big difference and increase your production. Mulching adds nutrients to your soil and reduces the need to weed and water as much. Um, I recently did an interview with Jeff Lowenfels, who's the author of the Teeming Trilogy, Teeming with Microbes, Teeming with Nutrients, Teeming with Fungi. There are these three books he wrote all about science health. He's like one of the leading science experts um, of our time. And we talked about, you know, what to do with an organic lawn. I said, I got that question a lot and he agreed. Mowing your lawn, letting the clippings fall and mulch into the lawn, add lots of water in the spring and add some culvert. Cause the number one question I got last summer and the summer before was, well, what do I do with my organic lawn? What do I put on it? What do I buy at the store? Like people were like, shiver, like, but I'm at the store. What do I get? What do I get when I go to the store? What, you know, and the seeds really are keeping the mower high, um, making sure you've got lots of clover. And then if you really have to put something on it, um, you could put uh, molasses, like a cup of molasses with a gallon of water, put it in like a sprayer and spray that on your lawn. Um, Jeff also thought you could mix like molasses granules with soybean meal. You are going to need quite a bit of that. Like, and as you can see, we have a lot of lawn because we live in Montana where the fire danger can be really high. So we have a pretty big fire break around our house, but our lawn's full of clover. And you can see my dog there, like our lawn's really tall right there. The deep roots, the tall blades, compost, mulch it with some clippings and the right seed for your soil. That's another key. Make sure you get the right fescue or, um, which is like a native, grass for your soil that will make the best organic yard a lot of our lawn is comprised of the fescue grasses that became lush from mowing and mulching it definitely thrives in august more when it's taller otherwise it'll just burn out it'll get short and brown but if we let it grow it'll stay a lot greener in august and then i dream of a day where i don't see any of those little yellow flags and if you can't see them the red arrows are pointing to all the little yellow flags in the neighborhood that say don't walk here sprayed with chemicals like I just think their lawns could be so much more lusher if they weren't spraying the chemicals. They're like drying up the dirt and killing the ecosystem. Um, the Brooklyn Grange there in Brooklyn, New York has the beautiful beneficial border growing all around the outside full of bright flowers that learn butterflies, pollinators, beneficial insects, protecting the crops from pests. Um, if you don't know what a beneficial insect is, um, it is... A beneficial insect is an insect that feasts on bugs and their larvae, which is their baby. So 
A beneficial insect is an insect that feasts on the bugs that eat your crops. They generally include ladybugs, lacewings, spiders, praying mantids, ants, earwigs, assorted beetles, assassin bugs, some wasps, centipedes, and even a few type of flies. Butterflies love zinnias. Another reason I love fruit trees is that um, they're blooming and they're some of the early bloomers and they'll, um, you know, that provides food and pollen for beneficial bees butterflies, other insects that will help keep your pests under control. Sunflowers are another one. Every garden should have sunflowers. I definitely would add that in even to the vegetable farmer challenge because it's going, they're going to attract aphids. The ants will climb the sunflowers. They'll herd the aphids in there. Um, they will attract beneficial insects that eat the aphids and they really will help your vegetable garden produce more food. Um, we definitely in Montana struggle with deer. The deer feel like our place is kind of a sanctuary, so they have to find their places. That's right outside. You know, there's our dog house and the deer's sitting there, but um, they're not allowed in the garden. We definitely still struggle to control squirrels, chipmunks, voles, mice, and other critters, but at least we've got the deer and the rabbits fenced out pretty much. Um, row cover is another way I talked to this woman, Lisa Ziegler, who's a big flower farmer on the East coast, um, by Virginia. Uh, she talked about row cover having two benefits. One, they help you extend your season. It'll keep things warm. Um, when the, from a danger of a frost, but also they help keep pests out and moss, et cetera, from like moss often will lay their eggs at night and you can keep your plants warm and keep the bugs out. And then you can either take it off at night or, the rain and the sun will just go through it. Um, so just the last wind up on insects, critters, and pests, because that seems to be people's biggest concerns with organic gardening. What do I do about all these things? Growing flowers that bring in beneficial insects is the best way to control unwanted pests. It'll keep your garden healthy. It'll make a, a nice ecosystem. Critters like deer and rabbits really need a physical barrier to keep them out of your garden. Using row cover to shield your plants is one of the most effective ways to keep them from pests, and it also helps with extending your season. Um, we didn't talk about a sacrificial plant. So a sacrificial plant one year might got like had broccoli that was so completely covered in aphids. It looked like it was moving. And, but like we had like 20 broccoli plants that year. And so we just let that one plant go and none of the other plants seem to have a problem. So that's what a sacrificial plant, sometimes you're going to want to let a crop grow or let a plant go. Um, and then if you move it the next year, like that's another secret to organic gardening. Never plant the same thing in the same place two years in a row. Um, identifying the problem, finding the best solution for your problem is the best way to deal with an infestation. So if something bad does happen, it's best to talk to somebody local, see if there's anything you can do to salvage it. And sometimes you're just going to have to, um, you know, get rid of those plants and start over. Often the only way to rid your plants of bugs in is the time consuming process of picking them off. And I've definitely had listeners talk about their $64 a pound squash because of all the time they spent picking the beetles off. But look at that lovely broccoli. We get such great vegetables. Mike is so persistent. Here's our essential tools list. A wheelbarrow with a flat free tire. We had a wheelbarrow with the tire went out and just a wheelbarrow I think is the most essential. I couldn't live without tool. We just are constantly using it for hauling things and moving rocks and hauling dirt and compost and moving plants and tr fruit trees and I don't know rocks like we live in the Rocky Mountains I think Mike hauled 21 wheelbarrows full out of the mini farm after year number like three or four um a long-handled shovel a sharp hoe pruners my mom got me these just fantastic cutco pruners that like cut through lilacs like they're butter just so good for deadheading the more you deadhead your flowers the more flowers you're going to get the broad fork i love the broad fork um a pitchfork i wish we had a pitchfork in each compost bin and a pitchfork's just a little bit different than a broad fork but mike turned the whole mini farm with a broad fork he doesn't really need to use the rototiller the first year he did but now he can pretty much just turn all that with a broad fork and that's great for your soil instead of um, really just destroying all your food soil web. A hand trowel for like digging little holes, a harvesting knife or a hori hori knife. Um, good hoses are so important. We're constantly moving hoses. We have to water a lot because we always have a lot of things growing. Clear plastic I think is essential or that row cover stuff, but we used clear plastic for years and plus Mike 
plastics in our porch for his seedlings in the spring. Um, a staple gun to cook all that plastic together. A portable drill. Mike's always building things. I think uh, having a portable drill is almost essential. Um, a spray bottle mister. That's really important for like when you're getting your little baby seeds off the ground. That's one of Mike's secrets. Garden gloves. I'm big on gloves. I just always wear gloves. Convenient compost bin. Totally essential. And a really good watering can. So believe it or not, that's the end of our free garden course. I hope you enjoyed it. What's up next? The 2020 Garden Goals Challenge. Your best garden ever coming in 2020.